Four Classes That Constitute a Menace From Anti-Suffrage, Ten Good Reasons By Grace Duffield Goodwin Reading by Bologna Times This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Four Classes That Constitute a Menace By Grace Duffield Goodwin we are a nation of unsolved problems. Brains and time and patience are going into their solution. Our Negro and our alien problem are ours alone. No other nation shows a condition in which these two difficulties exist side by side and press for solution at the same time. At present, no one is bold enough to say that we are finding it easy to amalgamate the sorrowful legacy of our own greed and inhumanity in the race of struggling children just up from slavery. Confused and bewildered even yet by the sufferings of the past, the burden of the present, the blind ambitions of the future. Our American Negroes are not yet woven into the fabric of our common life. Their ignorance, their helplessness, has not yet ceased to be a political menace. In the southern states, where white control is held only by the frankest bribery, where the Negroes number five to one, or ten to one, as the case may be, it is proposed to add, for further exploitation and bribery, all the Negro women who are more helpless and ignorant than the men. This is said with full realization of the numbers of Negro men and women who are far beyond the average of their people. One has but to see the race close at hand to recognize its sterling virtues and its dangerous weaknesses, virtues of sympathy, patience, cheerfulness, loyalty, weaknesses of moral fiber, and of mental grasp. We have the problem of the immigrant, coming here by millions in the last decade, coming from different political conditions, new to republicanism, new to responsibility, new to freedom, which, in the exuberance of the second generation, he misreads license. He clings to his own, and he makes in all our cities a ghetto, or a little Italy, or such a settlement as that of 50,000 Bohemians in New York, settlements which are not American in any particular. He populates the streets of the New England mill towns, until in Rhode Island one may walk perhaps two or three blocks without hearing a word of English. In five years he is a citizen. In five years he is expected, with the pressure of a terrible toil upon him, to learn the language, the customs, the ideals of his future home, and to become a unit in its government. As a matter of fact, the majority toil incessantly, learn very little, are exploited by the boss of the ward, know little and care less about the government of their adopted country. What we are doing to make him worthy of citizenship is but a drop in the bucket compared to his numbers and his need. We must put time and brains upon the problem of the foreign man as a voter. How will it help to add the foreign woman? All workers among these people recognize how much more backward is the foreign woman than the foreign man. Many of the women live years in this country without even learning the language. This is not true of the younger generation, which tends to irreligion and lawlessness. The reaction does not set in until the third generation, as those well know who have lived and worked among them. The older and the younger foreign women, for very different reasons, would add greatly to the danger of the naturalized foreign vote and as we are constantly receiving them, and as the quality is steadily deteriorating, 
we shall have this to consider for many years to come. The suffragist proposes to double these two problems. We have in common with all countries the problem of the vicious woman, numbered in our cities by the thousands. The suffragists tell us that they will not vote, that they will not register because they do not desire publicity. They are already registered in the list kept by the police in many cities. They are not classed as criminal, only as potentially so. They would not shrink from registration, and the men who exploit them would see that they voted. To a woman in this class, I said, not long ago, Do you want to vote? Yes, she replied. Why? I asked. What would you do with the ballot? God, she breathed, raising tragic arms above her head. I'd sell it and take a vacation. Another problem in all countries is that of the intelligent, conscienceless woman. She exists, and she is the companion of the intelligent, conscienceless man who plays politics for what there is in it, here in America, as perhaps nowhere else in the world to the same extent. The man who makes the public shame of Philadelphia, or Pittsburgh, or Denver, or San Francisco, or Adams County, Ohio. The shame of every American city and town that owns the rule of the boss and the ring, that has political axes to grind and political trades to make. Over against these four classes of undesirable voters among women would be the comparatively small number of earnest, intelligent women capable of handling public affairs. They would be overwhelmed by numbers. End of Four Classes That Constitute a Menace by Grace Duffield Goodwin